our prayer. Father, we praise you and we give you all of the glory, Lord. We know that you are good and you are merciful and you are compassionate and patient with us, Lord, for our many failings and our many uh, shortcomings. Lord, we pray that uh, for all these needs that have been lifted up to you on this prayer list, Lord, we pray that you would work in each person's life according to your will. Lord, we pray that you would work for your glory and for their good. Lord, we pray that, uh, that you would be with us tonight as we study your word, that you would challenge us with your word, but Lord, not just challenge us, but that you would change us and that you would make us more like Christ. And we pray tonight, God, that you would show us ourselves in your word and that your spirit would speak to our hearts. But Lord, more than that, we pray that you would show us Christ and that you would show us our Savior and that we would, as we gaze on the text, we would see the face of our loving Savior who died on the cross for us. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Alright, we'll be in Genesis 6, if you're not already there. We're going to read verses 1 through 8 to start this. It says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into, unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men which were old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man that I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I had made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, obviously we're going to be starting the passage about Noah and the ark and the flood. And um, this is one of the passages that is in conflict in Christianity today where a lot of Supposed Christians think that this is a myth, right? We talked a little bit about this at the beginning of Genesis, where people will come and they'll say Genesis is myth, and then it's just there to teach us moral stories and those kinds of things. Um, they'll come at it and say, there's no way Noah could have fit all the animals on the ark, right? Or all, enough food to feed all the animals for a year, and all of these sorts of things, um, which will actually answer those questions when we get to it later in the next couple of weeks about how Noah could fit all those animals on the ark, and actually how there was extra room on the ark, and why there was extra room. Um, but what we need to know right now is that Jesus and the apostles and the prophets all viewed this as an actual historical event, and that Noah was an actual historical figure. He's not a mythological person. This isn't a mythological event. This is viewed by all of the prophets and the apostles and even Jesus as being an actual event that took place. Isaiah and Ezekiel talk specifically about Noah and the flood as examples of what's going to happen in Israel. Peter mentions it twice. Hebrews 11, it gives um, Abraham and um, uh, Noah as an example of faith in, in Hebrews 11. And most importantly, Jesus regarded Noah as a historical figure. So number one in your notes is the flood narrative is literal history because Jesus, the apostles, and the prophets said it was. And then as we go through the rest of the narrative in the next couple of chapters, I'll point out all of the reasons why it's an actual historical event that happened. And even the evidence that we have that proves that it was a historical event that happened. Um, some people question this because there are ancient writings from the, from the Middle East and, and even in other parts of the world, like China, where they actually have stories of a flood. And certain parts of it are similar to the story we have in Noah. And they'll try to say that the Jews ripped that story off from all these other people, and that's where we get the story of Noah. But I actually think that it's the opposite, and that it's actually proved that there was a flood. Because if you have dozens of ancient civilizations with all of these writings that are very similar about this big event that happened, then that big event probably happened. Amen. Right? Now, the details might be wrong, but... In, in general, this event probably took place if all these people who didn't know each other and weren't connected by religion or even geography knew about this event, and it, it probably happened. Um, but we know that this account is the true account because, one, it's in the Bible, it's the Word of God, but also because Jesus referenced it as being an actual thing that happened. 
So we know this is the actual true account. So when we come to this section of Genesis, we approach it the same way we did the previous five chapters, that it's historical narrative, it's a true account, it actually happened, and we're going to do that as we continue all the way through Genesis, right? We know that all of it happened, it's true, it's historical, and we can trust the Bible that it's got the word. Now tonight we're going to look at the world that Noah lived in. So that's going to be kind of the focus tonight, the days of Noah. Um, and it's important, there's a bunch of reasons why we need to know that. One of them is we need to understand it so we can understand the whole story of the flood. We need to understand the time period they're living in and what's happening in the world. But also, it's in the Bible, right? That makes it important. We need to know that. More than all of that, and this is what's on your, on your sheet, it's important to know what the days of Noah were like because Jesus said that the days of his return would be like the days of Noah. And so we need to understand what was happening in the days of Noah so that we can discern the seasons and the times that we're living in. Because Jesus said, as the coming of the Son of Man will be, it will be as the days of Noah. Which is actually what he says in Matthew 24. Now, when we get into this passage, we're actually going to encounter three difficulties in, in this, these eight verses. This is why I couldn't do the whole chapter. Because there are three parts of this that we're going to have to spend a little bit of time on to answer. So one question is, who are the sons of God in verse 2? That's one question we're going to have to deal with. The second question we're going to have to deal with is, who or what are the giants in verse 4? And the third question is what it says in verses 6 and 7, that God repented. What does it mean that God repented? So we're going to have to deal with those three questions, and that's going to take a little bit of time to answer those. Uh, so we weren't able to get the whole chapter. So it's just not, not going to happen. So we're going to look at these eight verses. So the first part, um, the first section in these eight verses is the wickedness of the world. So Genesis is trying to set up for us a picture of just how evil and wicked the generation of Noah was. How, how vile the earth had become. And it starts off in verse 1. It tells us, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, which is what God told them to do, right? Multiply and fill the earth. The daughters were born unto them. And the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, they were beautiful, to look on, and they took them to be their wives. Now, there are multiple interpretations to this, and by far the most popular interpretation is that the sons of God were actually demons. That these were demonic beings that were having sexual relations with women, and they were having like these demon-human hybrid babies. And that's what the giants were in verse 4. That's by far the most popular interpretation of this text. And there are guys that I really respect and that I, I listen to that believe this, and I have just a number of issues with that interpretation. Uh, and I'll give you a couple reasons. Um, first, uh, no demon in the Bible is ever called a son of God. Amen. That is a reference that angels are called. Like in Job 1, the angels are called sons of God. But no demon is called that. And these are clearly... Uh, secondly, God clearly said in Genesis 1 that every creature would reproduce according to its kind. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so if I am mankind, they are angel kind. We can't have babies together, right? It's just like us trying to have a baby with a monkey. It's not going to happen. We're on the same kind, right? So, so you can't have a demon-baby hybrid. And then thirdly, there's a theological issue with it. If demons have no chance at repentance, and humans do, if you have a half-demon, half-human, can they repent, right? There's, there's a whole theological issue with that. Um, and then the, they try to say that because they're trying to figure out who the giants are in verse 4. And if you read verse 4, it's not actually saying that the sons of God came to the daughters of men and had giants. It's giving you a point of reference. It's saying in the days of the giants, the sons of God came to the daughters of men. So it's just giving you a point of reference for time. What I think it's saying is the sons of God are the sons of Seth. If you remember when we were starting in Genesis 3, when after the fall you have the curse and God tells Eve, that your, your seed is going to crush the head of the serpent, right? So it's going to be the seed of the woman. And then we followed that in chapter 4, where we had Cain and Abel. We had the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, right? And Cain kills Abel. But then at the end of chapter 4, we see that there's still the seed of the serpent, Cain and his line. Mm -hmm. And then chapter 5 is the line of Seth, the seed of the woman. And so you have this whole thing pitted up right up to chapter 6. And then you get here and you have the sons of God, 
which is these great <coughs> men and their generations in chapter 5 against the line of Canaan. All right? And that's the daughters of men. Amen. And so, uh, number three in your notes, the sons of God were the men of the line of Seth who were supposed to be followers of God in their day. So these are supposed to be the righteous men of their day. These are supposed to be the best of the best. They're the god fearers. But what they're doing is they're taking for themselves wives from the daughters of men, from the daughters of Cain and his sons. But the question is, is why is that so bad? What's wrong with that? Well, it says first that they saw that they were fair. Now, the phrase there in the Hebrew is the same as in Genesis 3, where it says Eve looked on the tree and it was pleasing to the eyes. It was pleasant to the eyes. It's the same thing there. It's a lustful intent. So, so they weren't just looking at them and thinking they're, they're nice ladies. There's a, a lustful push to this. So they're being driven by their desires. But these were the men of the line of Seth. These were supposed to be the line of the sea. They were men who fear God. And yet here they are being overtaken by their lust and actually taking ungodly women from the line of Cain. And that's number four. It was evil because they were being ruled by their desires rather than by God. They were being ruled by their desires. The point that God told them, if you remember all the way back in Genesis 1 and 2, when God commanded that they be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, remember I said the, the goal wasn't just to fill the earth with people, but to fill the earth with people who fear God. Right? With godly offspring. That's the goal. They're failing that goal. They're filling the earth, but it's not with godly children because they're godly men, supposedly, but they have ungodly wives. And when you have that union, you can't have godly children. They're following their own lusts and their own carnal minds, which is what Paul says in Romans 8. For they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, but they have the spirit the things of the spirit. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is is peace. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. And these men are being ruled by their flesh. And so they're actually um, taking on the same priorities as the line of Cain. They're, they're living the same way that Cain's descendants were living. They're living after the flesh. Now marriage is a high importance to God, right? Marriage is a sacred <coughs> thing. And when two people get married, the Bible says they become one flesh, right? They're a union of, they become one. And when we become careless about marriage, we're on a downward spiral from God's word. We can't be loose about marriage. And what's happening here is actually very subtle from Satan. So in chapter 4, he just outright murders Abel, right? He, he entices Cain to outright murder Abel. He's trying to destroy the seed of the woman. That didn't work because then came Seth, right? So now he's working more subtly. He's using these women to entice the sons of Seth. To come and take these wives that are going to actually lead them into immorality. Which is what we see happening in other parts of the Bible, right? This happens to Solomon. Solomon ends up getting enticed by these pagan women and he ends up turning away from God and leading Israel into disaster, right? That's a subtle attack from Satan. But one of the key purposes of marriage is to raise God with children. And those who fear God want to raise their children to fear God. But if you have a spouse who doesn't fear God, it's doubly hard to raise a child to be that, to be God. And so, these men, they began to multiply on the face of the earth, but they're multiplying the wrong way. They're intermarried with the line of Cain. But the seed of the woman and the seed of the devil blended together. And we see this warning all throughout the Bible. So, in the Old Testament, the Jews are told, you can't marry a non-Jew. It's forbidden. Right? And we're told to not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Right? It's the same principle. Now, I do want to point out, um, Jews are told not to marry non-Jews, not because of a race thing, but because of a religious thing. Okay? Um, and race is a non-category in the mind of God. Right? There's one race, the human race. But God does not want his people marrying the people of the devil. Right? There's, there's two kinds of people in the world. And if you read Ephesians 4, right? there is the children of the devil, and then there's the children of God. And God doesn't want his children marrying the children of the devil, and that's what's happening here. And we're warned in the New Testament of that not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, this is given not as a reason for the flood. All right? there, God isn't destroying the world in a flood because these godly men are marrying ungodly women. This is just an example of how wicked the world is becoming in the days of Noah. So this is number five. This is given as an example of how far humanity had fallen into immorality and wickedness. It went into what? Into 
It's an example. An example of how far humanity had fallen into immorality and wickedness. The earth had become so polluted that even the righteous line of Seth is becoming loose with their marriage. They're succumbing to loose morals and sexual misconduct. So when the supposed righteous of the earth fall into immorality, then humanity has truly lost its way, right? And that's the picture that Genesis 6 is trying to give us. And Jesus said that this would be the state of the world before his return. In Matthew 24, verses uh, 38 and 39, this is what Jesus says. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They will be marrying and giving in marriage. And the idea there isn't just like what we think of as regular marriage, but like what's happening here. They're loose with their marriage vows. There are loose morals on marriage, and that's exactly what we see happening today, right? The collapse of the family, the collapse of the home. Loose morals for marriage. And Paul says in 2 Timothy 3 that these things are going to wax worse and worse and worse until the end. We see uh, in our world Christians not caring about marrying unbelievers. I, I know, just off the top of my head, of at least four Christians that are willing and even attempting to marry someone who is an unbeliever, and their justification for it is, is, well, I can win them to Jesus after we're married. And I said, well, you can't justify disobeying God because of an out. Right? That's, that's not right. We obey God and we need the results of the coming. But God commands that we not be unequally yoked. We also see increasing perversion of what's right and wrong, with an extremely high growth of the divorce rate, a push to homosexual marriage. We see the normalization of homosexuality, and then we see many people today living together and sleeping together before they get married, right? Having children together before they get married. In fact, I would argue that it's way more rare to see someone who has waited until they were married to live together and sleep together than it is the opposite, right? It's, it's extremely more rare in our day to have someone who's waited until marriage to be with that person. And this is what's happening in Genesis 6. They're, they're loose in their morals and in their marriage. And then there's another element that compiles on top of this. Um, there is, according to Peter, 1 Peter 3, some sort of demonic activity that's attached to all of this. And I think that what's happening is, is that these sons of God, or these daughters of men, are demon-possessed. I think there's some sort of demonic activity in that their children are demon-possessed. And that's why they become the mighty men, which are all the men of now. Because we see in the Bible, for example, the demoniac, in, in the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus goes through the graveyard, he has superhuman strength, right? They chain him up and breaks the chains because he has all those demons living inside of him. And I think this similar thing is happening here. As Peter says, that the demons that were alive and doing these things in the days of Noah are already in chains and darkness, right? They're already in the torment of hell. And so there's some kind of demonic activity behind all of this, even though the Genesis is come out and so this is all in the backdrop. And so God makes a judgment on this wickedness that's, that's forming in verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And so we see in this the patience of God. So even the righteous of the earth are doing wickedness. They're doing evil things before God. And so God says he's going to draw back his spirit. His spirit is not going to always strive with man. He's going to pull back. And this is like Acts 17, 25, where Paul says he gives to all life and breath and all things. And when he pulls back his spirit, when he draws back, there's going to be death, there's going to be carnage, there's going to be disaster. Right? Um, I think R.C. Sproul said, if God were to move his hand off from the universe for even a millisecond, it would cease to exist. Right? He is holding everything together. And so when he draws back, it's dead, it's dangerous. And then he says that his days should be 120 years. He used to think. That meant men can't live more than 120 years. That man, that you hit 120 years old, you ain't making it past that. That's it. But if you keep reading Genesis, when you get to Genesis 10, there's another genealogy after the flood, and there are still men living to be five, 600 years old, which we'll talk about a lot later. That later. But what it's referring to is there is a set number of days or years from this point that God is giving them to repent. They have 120 years to repent. And the God's going to control the earth. And so that's number six. God waited patiently for 120 years before destroying the earth, giving them time to repent. 
This is the patience of God. Right? 1 Peter 3, verse 20 says, When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was prepared, were in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. It's the patience of God. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness, but it is the long-suffering of patience to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God is giving them a set number of time, a period, to repent. Because God doesn't rule that any man perish, but that all come to repentance. And Christ has not returned for the same reason. God's not slack concerning his promise. That God is being patient with us, giving us time to repent before judgment comes. And then we get to verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men. So, we've kind of talked about this in passing a little bit, but the giants in the earth are not a result of the unholy union between the sons of God and the daughters of men. Right? They were there already. There were giants in the earth in those days and after. So they're not a result of this unholy union that's going on. They're, they're there as a point of reference for time. And we know that they were still there after the flood. There were giants again. It's talked about all throughout the Old Testament. Um, in fact, well, first let me say this. When I say giants, we think about Jack and the Beanstalk, right? With like a 30 foot giant. That's not what the Bible's talking about. Probably 10, 12, maybe 13 foot tall men, right? That's a giant. Um, number seven, your sheep. The Bible teaches that there were men who were unusually large throughout the ancient world. We've actually found skeletons in the fossil record of human skeletons that were 12 foot tall men, right? Now, they don't put that in science books in the schools because that actually goes contrary to the theory of evolution. Evolution says we start out smaller and we're getting bigger and better. To start out with a 12-foot tall man is the opposite of evolution. But the Bible teaches us that there were large men in those days. There's one king in the book of Deuteronomy. His name is Ab. And his bed it gives us the dimensions of his bed. It's to the same dimensions as ours. Ab was probably about 13 feet tall. Uh, Goliath Probably the most famous giant in the Bible, right? Uh, was six cubits in a span, which, depending on what a cubit is, he was anywhere from nine to eleven and a half feet tall, right? Giants in the land. That's taller than any NBA player that has ever played in the NBA. But what we have here in verse four is a different class of ungodly men than what we have in verse two. So in verse two, it's showing us how wicked the world is by showing us even the righteous people doing wicked things. Here is showing us the wickedness of the wicked. These, these giants, these men of renown are doing horrible, wicked things. And the, the word giant doesn't just mean their size. It also means that they were terrifying and that they were doing horrible things, that they were doing great things. They were great men in the sense that they were huge and they were doing big things, but they were all evil. Uh, it's mentioned also in the book of Numbers when the Israelites are getting ready to go into the promised land. And they send the spies in. And the spies come back. And they say, the inhabitants, are, the land is full of the inhabitants and they're great of stature. They are as giants and we are as grasshoppers in their sight. And so they were terrified and they were afraid of these giants. They were violent men. They were the strongest and they struck fear in the hearts of all these people. But then it says that they came in unto the daughters of men. Now that phrase is actually different than the phrase in verse 2 where they saw the daughters of men and that they were there and they took them to their wives. So that is, they were taking the wrong women to be their wives. But here in verse 4 is the Bible's PG modest version of saying rape. That's what's happening. They're taking these women to themselves. They're not marrying them. They're taking them by force. That's what's happening. Number 8. The giants were big, strong men who were known and feared for their wickedness and violence. They were doing horrible things. They were ruthless. They were taking the women they wanted and they were doing it by force. And no one could stop them because they were giants. They were huge men and no one could stop them. And it says these men became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And so the famous men, the popular men, the well-known men of, of Noah's day were these evil, violent, ruthless men. These were the men that everybody liked, that wanted to strive to be like. These were the heroes of the day. These wicked, evil men, that's how vile Noah's generation was. 
that these are the men that people idolized and wanted to be like. In verse 5, it paints a picture that this wickedness was out of control. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So we have a progression here. So God pronounces judgment because of what's happening in verses 1 and 2, that there's going to be 120 years for the world to, to repent, and he's going to start withdrawing his spirit. And as God withdraws his spirit, his restraining grace on the hearts of men begins to fall away, and men become more and more wicked, right? This is Romans 1 being played out, right? Romans 1 teaches us that as men strive for sin more and more, God withdraws more and more and gives them what they want. And then men are given over to a reprobate mind. And that's exactly what's happening in the days of Noah. God is removing and restraining grace. And what we see happening is that the earth, in verse 11, the earth was corrupt before God and was filled with violence. Right? Not a lot of violence. Not very violent. Filled with violence. Everywhere you went, there was violence. Everyone was violent. And this is the reason, by the way, when you get to chapter 9, after the flood, you have the institution of the government. Because government has two duties, and that is to protect the rights and freedoms of people, right? And God instituted government to protect people because this is what's happening before the flood. And there was no government there to be the sword of justice. And men are still the same today. After the flood, God says this in Genesis 8.21. He says, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. That's the human condition. It's not just that mankind's activity is wicked, but even the intentions of his heart is evil. He pursues evil with all of his heart. That's what he wants. And then we see God's judgment in verse 6. And he repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and he grieved him to his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Literally, I will wipe them off the face of the earth. Now, what does it mean that God repented? Right? It's a difficult some people say it's one of the most difficult verses in the Bible because we don't understand exactly what God, what the Bible means there that God repented. But I think we can understand it. Um, when we hear the word repent, we automatically think of turning from evil to good, right? That's, that's just what we think of. That's what we've been taught repentance is. And in a sense, that is what repentance is. But the word, the phrase, is actually, it means to think again. So to pent on something means to think. And when you put re in front of it, it means to do it again, right? Like replay. It means to play again. So repent is think again. However, when it comes to the idea of God, God doesn't change. And God doesn't learn, so he doesn't change his mind. So what do we do with the fact that God repented? I think Matthew Henry said it really well. He said, it was not a change of God's purpose, but a change of his feeling towards man. So God didn't change. Man changed. And because man changed, now God's activity towards man is going to change. It went from, from love and fellowship to wrath, right? So from man's perspective, God turned. God turned his face away from man. He turned against man in wrath, right? He repented of doing good to man to doing evil to man, all right? Evil in the sense of, of harm. When Adam fell in the garden, God's relationship with Adam changed. Did God change? No, it was Adam that changed. And so God repented of his relationship with Adam. We see this picture in 1 Samuel 15. When the king Saul is made king of Israel. And the Bible says, God says, It repented me that I have set Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. It repented God that he made king Saul, Saul king of Israel. Yet, it wasn't a change of God's will. Because Jacob had said that the king would come from Judah. And Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. And so God's will the whole time was for David to be king, and ultimately Christ. That was God's will. So God didn't change his will, so repent doesn't mean to change his mind. The Bible uses this terminology to describe for us that God's method changed. His interaction with the individual is now different. And to prove my point, in that same chapter where it says that he repented that he made Saul king, he says this in verse 29. God will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. In the same chapter, it's 14 verses later, 
It says, God repented that he made Saul. And here it says, he's not a man that he should repent. Right? And so the idea is, is that when it says God repented, it means that he did it from our point of view. From man's perspective, God changed. God turned away from us. But from God's perspective, he never changed. He did. Right? So that's the difference. Number nine in your notes. Because of man's wickedness, God is sorrowful, and his relationship with man changed from one of kindness and fellowship to wrath and rejection. Isaiah 63.10 is a perfect summary of everything I've said. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. God turned and became their enemy. That is the literal meaning of repent. To turn. To turn. To turn. And so God turned his face away and became their enemy. He was now against them. And he did that because he's good and he's holy. God didn't change. Man changed. And so God turned against them. So I'm going to give you, uh, really quickly, four truths about God's judgment and wrath against wickedness from verses 6 and 7. So first, letter A, man's wickedness makes him an enemy of God. That's what it means that the Lord repented. He turned against man. Man is now the enemy of God. It is our evil and our sin that makes God our enemy. We live our own way and we follow the simple patterns of the world. We are acting as the enemy of God. We are living in a way that is contrary to God's ways. And we are actually pitting ourselves against Him. Right? James 4.4. 4. It says, You know that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whoever, therefore, will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. Whoever lives according to the pattern of the world is the enemy of God. Letter B. Man's wickedness grieves the heart of God. It grieves the heart of God. And that's exactly what it says in verse 6. It grieved him at his heart. It was a heavy sorrow on God's heart. It was an offense to him. It vexed him. It displeased him. And it moved him to the point of anger, right? Psalm 711 says God is angry with the wicked every day. And even as believers, we're told to not grieve the Holy Spirit, right? And so there's something about our sin that God hates that makes him grieve over it, sorrowful over our sin. So that should make us grieve over our sin when we do it because we're grieving the heart of our God. Let us see. Man's wickedness offends God's holiness and moves him to act in judgment. That's actually the definition of God's wrath. God's wrath is holiness. God's wrath is his holiness being provoked to anger. In verse 7, these aren't weak words, right? The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. He will destroy them, meaning to wipe them off, like a bug off a windshield, right? He is going to wipe them off. God repented of having these men on the earth, and so he's going to eliminate them. When God acts in judgment, he doesn't hold back. He doesn't cut corners. He brings swift justice against sin. But this should also teach us something about our own repentance. If this is God's attitude when he repents, when he changes, when he turns away, then what should our attitude be towards our own sin? We should wipe it off the face of our hearts. And letter D, God's judgment is thorough. It is thorough. Right? It says, not only will he wipe man off the face of the earth, but it says, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for ever repented of me, but I have made them. So God is going to destroy everything because he's, he's angry about the sin. And the reason he's going to destroy all of creation like that is because man is head of creation. And man's sin has trickled down into destroying even God's good created order. God when judgment day comes, every sin will be accounted for, right? Jesus said every idle word will be accounted for. There will be no sliding under the radar. There's no mountain to hide under. This is why simply thinking that your good can outweigh your bad is ludicrous. It's crazy. Every sin must be punished because God is good and holy. And the wrath of God is coming. And so we should repent of our evil ways and turn back to the Lord. Right? It wasn't Him that changed. It was us that changed. He's going to bring swift destruction. 
But then we get verse 8, and we get a breath of fresh air. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful thing? The Bible does that all the time. It would be, but we, we find in all these places in the Bible where, where it talks so harshly against sin and it shows the, just the, the raw evil of man. It always comes back with, with the word, but. But God, right, in Ephesians. But God did this. And here, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God is going to destroy the world in the flood, and all wicked men will be destroyed. But there is a man with a boat, right? And if you enter that boat, you'll be saved from the wrath of God. It's an amazing grace, right? We deserve judgment. Every man, even Noah, deserved God's judgment, right? Don't fall into the trap of thinking that Noah somehow earned God's favor. Noah wasn't saved from the flood because he did something right and because he was better than everyone else. It says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What is grace? Unmerited favor. Unearned favor from God. And that's number 10. Noah was saved by grace, which is unmerited favor, getting what you don't deserve. That's why Noah was saved, and that's why we're saved. And just like the days of Noah, God's wrath is coming. His judgment is coming on all wickedness, but there is a provision. Right? God has sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins in our place to take the wrath we deserve. And the doors, the ark of Christ is open, and all may enter in and be saved. And if we enter into Christ, we will be saved from the wrath of coming. And it was the same way in the days of Noah. They had 120 years to repent, to turn back to God, to help Noah with the ark, and then go inside. Time is short, the wrath of God is coming, and so we need to flee to the ark of Christ. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, we praise you for your word. Lord, we praise you for your grace. Lord, we know that if left to ourselves, we couldn't be saved. But Lord, by your grace, we have been saved through Christ. It is your amazing grace, that unmerited favor. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to never lose sight of that. To never begin to trust in our own flesh to save us, but to look to Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us to worship you, to honor you, to give our lives to you. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, give us passion, that we would go and compel men to come in to Christ, to be saved. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name.